Hey guys, how's it going? This is Matt Nader. Welcome back to your weekly dose of creepy pasta. We're back, as promised, with the second part and finale of the Upon a Crimson Throne series. I have to give props to the awesome people who helped lend their voices to bring this story to life. Many thanks to Terence Nicholson again, and this time we have Alison Goss joining in as well. I couldn't have done it without these guys, so please do check them out via their socials in the description of this video. Speaking of thanks, my other team who I couldn't do this without are the members of the Coven over on Patreon. If you'd like to help them support this channel and the things I do here, that's also in the description. Shoutouts as always to the Disciples. Tiffany, Subscribe SoundCloud, Teddy Dog, Kissing and Gunshots, Backwards D-Dog, Rambo Row, Vera Ohio, and Sylvia Kirschbaum. Thank you, one and all. Now let's get right back into this story. So as always, turn out the light, get comfortable, and let the story be finished. It's strange how things can be so set in stone that struggling against them seems less than futile. And yet I and the world remain unchanged and alive. Yesterday I was so sure that all I knew would be erased that I lost the will to finish telling my story, confessing my sins. So now I'll do just that. I'll tell you everything that's happened because, if anything, you deserve to know. On the night of October 18th, 2000, after a brief conversation, Don split Bruce's skull open with a wrench, stuffed his body into the trunk of his 1983 Mustang, and drove us to the gates of hell. I hate to admit that my shock was short-lived, and when he asked me to help him dispose of the body, there wasn't even a second of hesitation. We threw Bruce's body into the inky depths of hell. A pair of children, tossing a coin into a well, wishing for the world. At the bottom of that well, in the depths of hell, our wish was heard, and the world fell into its hands to give to us and to keep for itself. The moment Bruce's body hit the cave floor, the ground beneath our feet shifted and split with violence I didn't know was possible. With haste, Don got me into his car and sped away, as the magnitude of the tremors grew in their intensity. Fuck it, we're leaving right now, maybe? Don! He'd been so preoccupied with the earth, tearing itself apart, that he didn't notice the sky doing the same. The skies above splintered, cracked, and tore away from itself, revealing the black void that lay beyond sundered realities. In that timeless place, a monstrous eye blossomed into existence, its sheer size dwarfing all of sunset. Its scolera was stained a deep scarlet, and its golden iris were marked with unknown and elaborate runic symbols. Its pupil darted around wildly before settling its focus directly on Don and me. I could feel its malicious intent burning, scarring itself onto my very being. A primordial and insatiable hunger. It retreated into the void momentarily, and in that space of time, the earthquake subsided. Don floored the car, and the screeching of his car's wheels tore through the night air as we finally escaped from dirt roads onto pavement. Don was taking sharp turns at incredible speeds and taking us farther away from the town. The earth began to quake once more, the force threatened to send us flying off the road. I had a gut feeling that the earth and sky 
synchronized to some extent. So I looked back up at the sky. What I saw rendered mind and sanity, leaving only a deep, unyielding trauma. A colossal, grotesque hand was beginning to reach through the rift. I thought it would reach down and snatch us up to drag us into the dark dimension it originated from. The breath caught in my throat, and my heart hammered with such speed and force that I feared it would burst from my chest. I let out a sigh of relief when I saw that the hand was not reaching for us, but instead the town center behind us. And that's when the screaming began. The collective scream of a town roused from its slumber to see the heavens above ripped open. I saw the town shrinking as we drove further away. The hand was closing the gap between heaven and earth. We had reached the edge of the hills when it finally made landfall, and the shrieks reached a deafening crescendo, yet we didn't stop driving or think of turning back, or calling for help. We neared the highway that barred us from escape in the past, and flew past it. The second we crossed it, the screams, tremors, the nightmarish hand, even the road behind us, it all vanished. Where there once was a turn-off that led you into the hillside, and on to Sunset Valley, now was grasslands, the hillside where sunset should have been, was nothing but thick forest. We drove in silence. The longer we sat in it, the larger the gap between us grew. By the time the car was empty and we pulled into a gas station, I knew that Don and I would never be the same. We stayed together for about four months after that, hopping from odd job to odd job and city to city. I never heard anything about Sunset Valley though. It's not like I ever asked. Don and I never talked about it, but the dreams never let us forget. One day, while Don was working, I just walked away, caught a bus. And left. Despite it all, I somehow found a way to fall into the facade of stability. It all went by so quickly. Every waking moment was a blur. My whole life, fast forwarding before my very eyes. When did I meet Rachel? When did I get married? A white dress, red roses, a child born, my daughter's first words, when and how, I don't know, it was all simultaneous to me, it was only in my dreams where it was all truly clear, lucid, real, when the realities between the waking and slumber bled into each other and became one, that's when the trance I was in was finally dispelled. What now? How do I move forward when I spent the last 20 years on autopilot, distant and disconnected from reality? Maybe that's the nature of trauma, locked in that perpetual state. When I reunited with Don a few days ago, I thought I could never forgive him. In the diner, where a smirk carved into his handsome face was enough to leave me in reminiscent awe. It was from my mind. On the drive to sunset, through countless miles spent on highways, and I dreamt of our best moments, the grip of anger never loosened, and when we crested the once hidden hills of sunset and gazed upon the corpse of our old home and saw that it became the foundation of a flesh-bound capital. I fell into crushing, soul-rending despair. Now that it's all over, I'm glad I got to see him one last time. 
I hope that he found some solace in the end. I couldn't have made this journey alone. I wish I could go back to that moment, atop the hills overlooking sunset, looking down at the hell below. I would have let him know that he wouldn't face this alone. Instead, we both descended into that town. No words or even acknowledgments shared between us. When we reached what was once Main Street, we stood in awe at how it had changed. Storefronts and offices were now blanketed in pale flesh. The floor itself was one pulsating organic mass. The car stalled before we reached it, and were forced to walk on its grotesque surface. I cringed every time I felt blood vessels and organs squirm and burst under my weight. Don walked ahead of me. I struggled to keep up and called out, asking him to wait. For what? We're out of time, Jack! Take a look around. He paused and scouted the area, taking only a brief moment to acknowledge the gathering horde of flesh constructs. The creatures gazed at us with curiosity, but kept their distance. We walked past them and headed toward the woods, not wanting to see what our homes had been terraformed into. We reached the edge of the woods. Here the forest was mostly free of the flesh. The exception was a single path scabbed over with diseased tissue. We decided not to walk on it, and instead took an alternate route alongside it. We walked in silence, just like so many times before, and it was infuriating. Don would either withdraw into silence or explode into hostility when confronted with extreme stress but I wasn't going to let him get away with it this time. Hey, slow down. I'm not going to let you keep getting away with ignoring me. Not after. After what? After what you've done. I fucking knew it! You blame me for all this shit! You of all people! Don said with a rising edge to his voice. Because it was your fault. You were the one who killed Bruce. It was your idea to dump him in that fucking hellhole. It was all you. All because of what? Don lunged at me. I tried moving out of the way, but his speed was incredible, and I couldn't dodge in time. We both went down and tumbled down into a nearby ditch. Don pinned me down and got real close to my face. Anger desperation, and anguish above all, shone in his eyes. Bruce was the one that came to me. He wanted someone to take the blame for Alice. He demanded that I confess to being the one that knocked her up, to clear his name. And if I didn't, he'd tell everyone about us. I was scared. Of what? Of being exposed? I thought you of all people wouldn't care about something like that. I thought you of all people had the strength to stand up to him. Don was taken aback by my words, as his grip loosened and he retreated into that seldom seen, timid persona. I broke free from his hold and I pushed my back into a corner, trying to create as much distance as possible. Don's stern expression softened into one of sorrow. His voice was calm and melancholic as he spoke. You're right. I didn't. And I still don't. I wasn't scared about me. I was afraid of what could and would happen to you. Idiot. You still had one more year bound to that place. The thought of what could happen to you in that year. The thought of you being hurt. The thought of losing you. It terrified me. I stood in complete disbelief. Unable to respond. And yet Don continued to dismantle the anger I once held for him with every word he spoke. You think of me as this remorseless monster, 
But you're wrong. You think because I refuse to spend years in a guilt-fueled haze that I don't regret anything? I constantly feel the subtle self-destructive urges clawing at the corners of my mind. But what good would it do if I buried myself in self-pity and gave in to my worst habits? What would I gain? The only way for me to move forward is to cut away the past and take each step on my own accord. I'm a selfish fuck, I'll admit it. I wanted it all with no compromise. I wanted you by my side to the very end. I wanted to defy every single person that looked down on me. And I wanted to break free from this place. It's ironic. In the end, I still lost you. There was no one left to defy, and I can hardly call this freedom since I ended up back here anyways! Don sighed and continued. <sighs> Do you know what my mom tried drilling into my head ever since I was a kid? She tried to raise me to want nothing, take nothing, leave nothing. To live as if you were never even here. It was the Moretti motto. No one liked us to begin with, so why make it worse? If I had listened, maybe none of this would have happened. But living like that isn't living. I refuse to live for anyone but myself. That's not fair. You can't just absolve yourself of any wrongdoing with a few words. I won't drop this. Of course I can't. That was never the plan. I came here intending to put an end to all of this. If you won't believe me, then I'll show you. How? I don't understand what you're fucking saying. I'm saying I have a plan. Bullshit. How could you plan for this? I didn't spend all this time just sitting on my ass. I spent years figuring out just what the fuck happened. So enlighten me. What the fuck happened? Don explained how the nightly dreams that had haunted us both were the most significant clue. It was a hint, left behind by otherworldly beings nonchalantly throwing out the regal title of their ruler. She who sits upon a crimson throne. I had heard it many times, but never knew what it meant. Don searched thoroughly through public documents but it wasn't until he joined a shady group interested in the occult that he found a lead. It led him to the Grimoire of Madness, an ancient text outlining the many cults and practices of centuries past. It took years to get a hold of a copy, did dirty work for a few private collectors, and that shady organization. A few hours with the book was his payment. He finally found what he was looking for, in a section on a cult infamous for human sacrifice and blood rituals. The chief deity was called Verith, King of the Malcontent Heart, and He Who Hates. Among his pantheon, the most esoteric of deities mentioned was referred to only by the title Heiress to the Crimson Throne. It has to be her. I looked for that version of her name and found so much more. What they've been calling her now is a recent name change. So? So it all lines up. I can piece together what happened and how she was brought here. This town's history and its mysteries were hard to find, but not impossible. Files and records always exist somewhere. I had to pull a lot of strings and do a lot of favors with bad people to get the dirt on this town. What did you find? In the mid-60s, a small group of hippies gathered in these woods here and formed an interfaith community. The locals were upset but couldn't do much due to the lack of a police force. So for years these hippies lived out there and got into some bizarre occultic shit, and they just kept spiraling into the more fucked up territory. It was the Manson murders that finally pushed them over the edge. In the early 70s, they started worshipping a collection of deities they referred to as the Court of Crimson Throne. Chief amongst them was this Crimson Heiress. They got it into their heads that she was a wish granter, and with the right offerings, they could wish for her to start some kind of revolution. Typical hippie bullshit. But local wildlife and a few pets weren't going to get her attention. The grimoire states explicitly that only the sacrifice of the most revered person in the vicinity is enough to summon her. The town was smaller then, and no one was noteworthy. I stood in stunned silence. It all fit. 
Though public opinion about Bruce was starting to wane, he was still the most respected and influential person in town. Who would have thought two stupid teenagers would, by accident, be the ones to complete apocalyptic rites set into motion decades prior? We couldn't have seen it coming. No one could. The realization began to unravel the anger that had bound me for so long. So, what now? Is there anything we can even do? I asked. In the grimoire, she stated to be a lesser deity, because for her to fully occupy our world, she has to anchor herself to a physical body and declare herself ruler through some elaborate coronation ritual. Until then, she's only partially connected to our world, linked by something that entered our world the moment the rift was open. Since humanity hasn't been enslaved yet, I believe she hasn't taken a body, or at least it's not complete, leaving only one link binding her here. If we can find it and destroy it- You really think that would work? It can't be that easy. Nothing ever is. We could search this whole town and still not find shit. It's most likely going to be in that cave, in her throne room. It's something foreign to our world, so when we see it, we'll know. Even if we do find it, what then? I don't see how you plan on destroying an artifact like that. Don patted the backpack he was carrying. This baby is loaded with a dozen grenades and a few incendiaries. Oh, and I still have this baby. Don waved around a revolver. I recognized it as his father's old Smith & Wesson Model 27. The steel glinting faintly in the filtered sunlight. I couldn't help but laugh at his plan. Typical Don. Dedicated years of his life to this cause. And that's the best he could come up with. And if that fails, what then? I asked. I do have one final contingency, but I'd rather not resort to using it. Took me years to get hold of the son of a bitch, so I'd rather hold on to it. But if the need arises, well, I'll just leave it in your hands. I mulled over my options and realized I had none. It was far too late to turn back. It was either go down without a fight, or die throwing a literal Hail Mary. I owed it to my family, my friends, and myself to at least try. I turned to Don and said, fuck it, before I could run ahead. Don grabbed my shoulder and pulled me aside. What's... what's her name? I could have played dumb, feigned not knowing who he was talking about. In all honesty, he probably already knew her name. But I owed it to him to hear it from my lips. Rachel. Do you love her? At some point in time, I did. But you know how things are. People drift apart. Yeah. And things... Are never the same. He pondered a moment before he asked his next question. Who are you here for? Her name is Sophie. She turned six a little while ago. She's got my eyes, you know. My eyes and nose. Do you want to see a picture of her? Save it for when this is over. He said with a small laugh. And who are you here for? He was quiet for a moment before answering. Myself. I didn't know how to respond. Maybe there was no adequate response. All I could do was give him a reassuring pat on his shoulder as we walked forward toward the gates of hell. The cave entrance was decorated in fresh blossoms, stained a variety of hues, bruised violets, gangrene rosettes, blackened buds, a menagerie of the fantastically fucked up, a grotesque garden in full bloom in the courtyard of hell. 
I can't believe we have to go through Satan's asshole to get to this bitch. Don suddenly quipped. Don, this isn't the time. I said it in a tone as serious as I could muster, although I struggled to keep a straight face. And Don noticed, and let out a half laugh. Even I had to admit that the orifice that lay before us was hysterically insane. Still, it was impossible to fully settle into hysterics, knowing what it led to. The once sheer drop was now sloped and had smooth pink flesh, encasing its entirety. Don was the first one to step in, visibly cringing when he lifted his foot to see the bottom of it was covered in a viscous, clear fluid. He shone his flashlight light around and revealed that the cave went on for a considerable length. I stepped in to follow him, and the moment we both entered, the groves and flaps of flesh dotting the walls of the entrail slash cave system stirred and opened. Eyes. Dozens of eyes of all shapes and sizes focused their gaze upon us. Some were tiny black dots, while others were as large as my torso, irises bright with livid incandescence. Pupils were bent and warped into alien shapes, hateful polygonal forms with sharp angles that hinted at the pain they so desperately wanted to inflict. I knew they belonged to her, the Crimson Heiress. The deeper we went, the lighter the tissue became, shifting from red to pale pink. The passage widened into a larger chamber. At the end was a massive bulbous appendage mounted to the wall, a small fist-sized opening in the middle. The realization that it was meant to resemble a cervix made me seriously ponder the nature of this structure. I went fist first into the fleshy mass, the opening dilating to make room for my passage. When I finally burst through to the other side, I made sure to swing around to face the pseudo cervix. When Don's hand reached through, I took hold of it and pulled him through. When he finally looked up, he let out a barely audible sound. He gripped my hand with such strength that it ached, and I squeezed back as I steeled myself to turn around. At the moment I saw, the second my mind processed the sight before me, I knew it was my greatest mistake. Even in my darkest of dreams, nothing came close to this level of depravity. A mass of wriggling flesh made up of hundreds of human bodies, naked and fused into what could have only been her throne. I knew them. I saw the unmistakable expression of recognition cross their faces when they saw us. At the very base, acting as a trunk of sorts, was the contorted body of Bruce. A smooth black sphere buried deep into the center of his chest. His eyes darted back and forth between Don and I. I looked away. I couldn't bear it. They had all been alive, conscious, and in unimaginable torment for the last 20 years. It was a blessing that I couldn't see the faces of my parents. I hoped Don was given the same mercy as I collapsed into his chest, and he fell to his knees. Rise, said a familiar voice. That blue-cloaked bishop levitated above us, along with three other cloaked figures of varying colors. Red, yellow, purple. The rest of the bishops. Stand and face your queen. She has long awaited your arrival, for the arrival of the Crimson Princess, 
future heirs to the Crimson Throne. As if possessed, we turned to face the throne once more. My mind reeled and struggled to fight against looking at that wretched thing once more, but my body refused to comply. A massive form now sat on the throne, mercifully obscuring the majority of it. It possessed a body that was a bastardization of the female form, arms and legs devoid of flesh, revealing muscle and blood vessels. A massive pelvis consisted of only bone and two prominent flayed breasts. Her head was severely misshapen. From her shoulder blades, thick bundles of nerve fibers extended out and linked her to the base of the throne, directly to the smooth black sphere at the center of Bruce's chest. The most striking features were her eyes, scarlet, burning, marked with familiar eldritch runes. It was those very eyes that peered from the fractured realities, through the heavens above sunset and onto us. Those insatiable eyes that hungered for conquest, for dominion, for corruption and the vilification of all she set her hateful gaze upon. And so she spoke. Burst from the womb of cosmic entropy. Conceived from the stray postal ages of the second born, he who hates. I arose from amniotic fluid of a billion sundered realities, and fed upon the world that lay before me. Uncountable civilizations fell under my ceaseless conquest. I was to feast upon it all, to devour the whole of existence, until the hateful god had me imprisoned within this infinite labyrinthian recess that ran concurrent to all that is and is not. But you, lost children of creations long forgotten, have given invitation, no, demand that I take my rightful place upon a throne, stained crimson with the blood of all that has and will exist. And you, lost children, have been rewarded a place amongst my court as princes, heirs to the same wine empires, deification within my pantheon, and your innermost mortal desires fulfilled. So look upon this palace of Isra, and know that this is my fetid womb, and the genesis of a new era. Take pride in knowing that you will be part of its legacy. Her voice should have been one that could shatter mind and poison flesh. It should have been the voice of a dictator, hardened to steel, or of a being that could not and should not be comprehended. Instead, it was tender, matronly, almost comforting. That was the terrifying part. With that voice, she had commanded genocides on an unprecedented scale. I wanted to run away, bury myself in that misery that hung over my life for so long and sink into apathy. But I owed it to everyone that suffered because of me to at least attempt redemption. Why did you do this to all my friends? We didn't wish for this, so why subject them to something so cruel? Yours were not the only ones granted. The third prince, the catalyst for my arrival too, had his wishes granted. See, this lost child feared that which he could not comprehend, that which he strayed from the standards set by his forefathers. So he dedicated himself to enforcing the order that defined his existence. To have a challenge and defiled would be to have his very being torn asunder. So I made him the center of this place's existence, the pillar that binds our planes, and the future overseer of this, 
corner of reality. What kind of fucked up monkey's paw shit is that? And what about us, huh? You can't call the last 20 years a wish granted. Don yelled. She twisted her lips into a smile. Her eyes focused on me for a mere moment before her hand lunged out at dizzying speeds and took a hold of me. I was flung violently into the air. I felt my limbs fail about before something caught me. The sudden stop caused my head to whiplash, and the stinging in my skull made it apparent that I had suffered a concussion. I saw a giant flesh tendril that had formed from the ceiling and grabbed me before I collided into it. I could hear Don's panicked voice pleading with the crimson heiress. Wait, stop, please, why did you- To get a rise out of you. Just let him go, you can take me instead. Lost children shouldn't bargain with their mothers. Your demands have already been met, and yet you beg for more. Unruly child, I should punish you. Unruly child, you know not the meaning of agony. Unruly child, how should you be disciplined? I promise never to challenge or disobey you. I'm grateful for what I've been given and will ask for no more. Don replied. The crimson heiress's smile softened, and the tendril coiled around me, loosened, enough for me to fall through its grip and be caught by her. She then bent down and placed me back down on the soft, fleshy floor. Don was at my side, helping me up. He mouthed a silent apology as I leaned against his shoulder. You are to refer to me as the mother of lost dreamers, Dale Teff. That is the name I have chosen to take upon my coronation. She gestured with her hand, and the whole throne room blossomed into complex and intricate regal displays. Columns, halls, pews, tables, and pseudo-floral centerpieces formed instantaneously carved of flesh. Wisps of colorful smoke rolled in and materialized as the four bishops. They carried a massive circlet, jagged antlers spilling out from all around it. At its points, the calcified remains of some creatures were impaled, their faces locked into an eternal scream. Most of them were unrecognizable as beings from this realm, except for the human one at its center. Trophies from previously conquered worlds. The bishops floated towards Daleteth, intent on placing the crown upon her head. I knew when that happened, it would be the end for us all. I took a hold of Don's hand, squeezed it, a gesture he returned. We knew that it was now or never. Don slipped a small object into my pocket, took off his backpack, pulled out a single pin, and flung toward the base of the Crimson Throne. He let out a casual, almost comedic hey as the pack soared towards Bruce. Dale Teff turned her head at the sound. The way she was positioned made it impossible to intercept the explosives. Or so I thought. She let out an incredibly fast kick and caught the pack with the edge of her heel. As soon as she made contact with it, it detonated. The explosion set a deafening shock wave throughout the throne room, followed by a series of smaller staccato-like explosions and bright flashes. When they ceased, I could see most of her right foot was obliterated, and the incendiaries had caused her calf to catch on fire. She turned fully to face us. Her face was twisted into an expression of pure rage. Don gave me a quick knowing glance, his eyes telling me 
It's up to you now. He turned to run, and maybe he could have outrun the now seriously impeded Ares, but before he could even take the first step, three tendrils burst from the floor and lashed out at Don. He dodged all three of them with ease, rolling out of their grasp. As soon as he landed on his feet, three more tendrils burst underfoot. Don must have spent the last two decades honing his reflexes, because his reaction time was inhuman, dodging and weaving out of the way at incredible speeds. However, he was beginning to be overwhelmed by sheer numbers. I was shocked by how long it took for one to catch him at an angle he couldn't recover from and pin him down. Daltaf, having extinguished the fire during the confrontation, got down on her three remaining limbs and charged forward. As she passed me, she struck me with the sole of her foot, sending me flying backward. I landed near the base of the throne, the wind knocked out of me. My entire body ached, but most of all, my diaphragm burned with an intense pain every time I breathed. My only thoughts were of Don. I had to help him. I saw that Daltef now held him in her left hand, a stream of incomprehensible obscenities spewing from her lips. The floor in front of her split open. I saw hundreds of tendrils form inside the chasm. At the end of each, a different instrument of torture was attached. Prongs, drills made of bone, fine needles, mouths with jagged teeth, cleavers, and uncountable others. She held Don over the pit, lowering him slowly into it. The longest of the tendrils, one with a bone sickle, lashed out and slashed at the base of his ankle and made a shallow cut that drew blood. A few drops of blood fell into the crevice, driving the rest of the twisted mass into an even greater fervor. Panic and adrenaline surged through me, masking the pain with the need to act. With a sudden recollection, I dug into my pocket and pulled out a small dagger, Don's contingency plan. It was sheathed in a scabbard made from a material I'd never seen before. It felt almost gritty. It was pure black so dark that it visibly darkened the area around it. I unsheathed it, and the dagger itself was even more mysterious. It was made of a metallic material, silver in color, and seemed to be incredibly reflective. A halo of multi-hued light shone off of it. It was tiny, only two inches from pommel to tip, but incredibly elaborate engravings covered its entirety. The strangest part was that it seemingly ionized the very air around it. Merely holding it unsheathed sent waves of volatile energy throughout my body. This couldn't have been created in our reality. It was far too alien. But if anything could shatter the seal that bound Delta to this reality, it would be this. I knew where it was. She said it herself. The pillar that chained our worlds together. I sprinted to the very base of the throne. I averted looking at Bruce's face. Looking at anybody in that writhing mass. Even as the screams and moans intensified. I tried raising the blade, but found my body refusing to comply. A cold chill ran up my spine at that moment. The paralytic fear returned. I was frozen in place. Terrified thoughts forcing themselves into my mind. What if it didn't work? What torment would Delta subject me to for my betrayal? Should I just do nothing and give in? Maybe... My family would be spared. Maybe I would be rewarded. I felt shame for even pondering those things. 
I'd spent so much of my life locked in passive fear and bouts of apathy. But I had also fought against the vices that would have plagued so many in my state, and my mind was still intact. Yes, I had suffered long periods of dissociation, but in my dreams, my mind was also hardened. That was evident by the fact that I was still sane. How many others would have lost their minds, broken apart from what I've seen here, from what I've been through? That was my hidden strength. I could resist that paralytic, insanity-inducing fear. My whole life, I'd fought to break free from the forces that sought to control me. This wasn't any different. This was the chance to finally cast off the chains that had bound me into that pathetic state for so long. Fear, trauma, regret, all of it. I refused to fall into the trance they had held me under for so long. I know now that everything that has ever happened was building to this very moment. This was my life's crescendo. I drew the blade and positioned myself so my face was level with the small black sphere in the center of Bruce's chest. It looked as intangible and imperceivable as a black hole. I raised the blade, and with the greatest resolve I had ever felt, tried to drive it into the center of the sphere. But the objects repelled each other, as if the existence of these two contradicted each other to such a degree that some innate, universal force drove them apart. As soon as the blade was deflected away, Deltaf twisted her head to face me and let out a world-shuddering roar. The bishops that had been on standby, still holding the crown, dematerialized into smoke and rushed towards me. I recentered the blade and tried once again, plunging it into the seal. I was met with a torrential current of energy, repelling the blade away. But I held firm. With both arms keeping the blade in place, I pushed forward inch by inch, slicing through that universal force that fought with all its might to keep the two separate. I pushed until the blade was less than a millimeter from the sphere. At that moment, a flesh tendril formed behind me, the edge calcifying into a bone spear. The bishops materialized above me simultaneously, each brandishing a bronze pike. As all five of the pointed weapons were thrust down towards me, I used the last of my strength to throw the entirety of my body into one final push. I was nanoseconds away from being torn apart when the blade finally made contact with the seal, and both shattered instantaneously. The emanation of energy that was released must have shaken the very foundations of our reality. The throne immediately calcified into the ivory bone, and the calcification rapidly spread out throughout the throne room, petrifying the bishops and the tendril in place, locking them into an eternal state of assault. Another scream ripped out from Deltaf, and I turned to see that she had dropped Don onto the still fleshy floor, narrowly avoiding the tendril-filled crevice. The tendrils themselves had ceased their flailing and instead spasmed meekly as they fell to the rabid calcification. I could see that Deltaf's body itself was beginning to turn to bone but she was fighting it every step of the way. Her foot and foot stump had already fused to the ground, and the calcification was spreading up her thighs. She was no longer mobile, and instead had drawn her hands to her face in clear distress. Though I was in excruciating pain, I still ran to Don's side. <laughs> we did it. We really fucking did it. He let out a small, pained laugh. 
I could feel the tears beginning to form, but I pushed them back and instead rested some of my weight upon his shoulder. I turned to face the throne, the faces of the people I knew and loved still fused into each other, but they looked like marble busts, their expressions showing that in their final moments of life, they felt relief, an emotion I shared. I was snapped back into reality by the hoarse, ear-splitting shriek of Daltef. She hadn't calcified yet. The petrification had progressed up to her pelvis and was starting to spread to the base of her spine. She delivered a series of powerful blows to her spine in an attempt to sever it, all while screaming. I won't allow it. I spent an eternity locked away in that boundless place to escape its holds only to be banished by the motherless children. It was your hearts that called out to me. It was the dreams of the lost, the castaways, the bohemians. I answered your call. Is this not what you yearned for? I will not leave this place. I will not return to that prison to be ground under my father's heel. My dream of escape will not end here. Delta finally succeeded in detaching herself from her lower body and now stood on both of her hands. Don and I set off toward the pseudo cervix that acted as an entrance. It was ivory white and fully dilated, the opening now wide enough for us to dive through. Don going first, spearing through it in an almost graceful dolphin-esque manner. I was right behind, clumsily rolling through, but I was on my feet in an instant. The both of us ran the cave entrance. I had hoped the bone cervix would at least slow down Daltef, but she tore through it like tissue paper and was right behind us. My body had reached its breaking point a while ago, and now it was starting to fail on me. I wouldn't hold out much longer. Daltef had closed the gap considerably and was now at our heels. If we could at least make it into the woods, we could split up, and one of us could survive. I could finally see the cave entrance up ahead. Pale moonlight shining down and reflecting off the ivory bone. We ran toward the ever-expanding ring of moonlight, Deltef almost directly behind us. As we came upon the exit, we leapt out with the last vestige of our strength in hopes of creating as much distance as possible. Deltef had the same idea. Using her arms, she lunged out of the cave and landed on the ground in front of us the impact displacing dirt and grass. I collapsed onto the ground, completely fatigued and no longer able to move. Don was still at my side, trying to get me on his back to no avail. I yelled at him to run, that only one of us had to die here, but he refused to budge. Her massive hand was upon us, her fingers curling around our bodies and closed my eyes, hoping that death would come quickly. I stayed in that still darkness, heart hammering in my chest, each beat sending a dull ache through my body. My lungs and ribs burned with scorching agony every time I took a breath. At that moment, I was ready for death to still my pain. It never came. I slowly opened my eyes to see that the fingers and palms of Deltef's hand had turned white. Pale bone reflecting the light of the moon, set on the backdrop of a clear, cloudless sky. The scars that once raked across its facets finally gone. The petrification spread quickly up Deltef's neck and a sinister smile spread across her face as she spoke. I see now. You are no mere lost children, 
Nor are you lost dreamers. You knew from the very beginning what your heart yearned for. What a grand dream it was. But alas, all dreams must come to an end. And so too must its inhabitants. I enjoyed my fleeting time here. But if I must return to my reality, I will do so with poise. However, know that every single longing thought and fleeting dream makes its way to me. As long as there are lost dreamers pining for what lies beyond their reach, there will always be a door from which I can enter. Farewell, little dreamers, heirs to my throne, princess of the endless dreamscapes, await my return. And with that, she completely solidified. Her body stood as a monument to the havoc she wreaked in so little time. Don and I just lay there on the forest floor, looking past the tree canopy at the sea of brilliant stars that stretched on infinitely. They had never looked so beautiful in my life. And so we lay there in comfortable silence, letting our minds and bodies rest. I awoke to the first rays of dawn. I sat up to see that Don had his back to me. He was facing towards sunset. Still sore, I walked toward him, and he turned to face me and gestured toward the town ahead. All of sunset had been calcified. What remained was the ivory capital of an empire that never was. I know that the sight should have filled my heart with melancholy, but instead, a profound relief put me at ease. Now that the ghosts that have long haunted sunset have finally been laid to rest, I have nothing left to grieve for. I took a picture of Sophie out of my wallet and placed it into Don's hand. He studied it for a moment and let out a hearty laugh. Damn, she really is the spitting image of you. Maybe you can meet us sometime. Maybe, he said vaguely. We'll meet again, won't we? Of course we will. It's the way things are. We're bound no matter how you look at it. First, I have some stuff to take care of, though. Old obligations. Not sure how long it'll take, but when I'm through, I'll stop by to check up on you. Meet the missus and Sophie. Just wait for me, okay? You know I will. I always do. Don insisted that I leave him there. That I make the journey home alone. That I needed the time to mull over all that's happened. I believe that it was because his journey wasn't over yet. That he didn't have a home to return to. It was a journey he'd have to finish on without me. But I'm glad I was there for a small part of it. That he was here to help me reach the end of mine. I don't know where I'll go from here. But I know that the paths I've walked and the dreams I've chased all led me to this end. I can only wonder what awaits me in my dreams.